it's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I, hopefully I'll be able to give a coherent talk. I just arrived from Canada yesterday, so I'm a bit jet lagged. But as uh, Kali said, I was actually Buzz Hollings' last PhD student. So I think that this may be an honor to me or may be a dishonor if I think, you know, I, I, I uh, ruined Buzz for other graduate students. They didn't want to work uh, with anyone else after all the problems for me. But it was really a, a, gr a great uh, privilege to work with Buzz. And what, what I'm going to do now is sort of go uh, backwards a little and not talk about all the things that Buzz has done, but talk about really his contributions to ecological theory. And he's contributed to other things as well. But in some ways, uh, I was looking at all the things that people were talking about. And there's going to be some overlap of what other people are saying. But it felt it was important to sort of give some uh, discussion of the progression of his ideas and what a major contribution he's made to people's ecological thought. And just to sort of summarize this, I sort of lump things into three main categories. One is predation theory, which Buzz did now almost 50 years ago. And this sort of really came out from his PhD research. Uh, but the main papers were published in 1959 to his early work on resilience uh, in 1973, so over about 35 years ago, to then a bit more uh, poorly defined and I sort of lumped together work on adaptive cycle and panarchy, which I think are very closely connected with the main or critical contributions being in 1986 in a book chapter in Sustainable Development of the Biosphere, which set the stage for a lot of other stuff. And then the book uh, Panarchy that was already mentioned that was done with Lance Gunnarsson as more product of the Resilience Alliance. And on, on the, the right of this uh, slide, there, there's three little graphs. And the, these aren't um, comprehensive or anything. They're really meant to be indicators. And what this is all showing is the number of citations per year of, of, the, of the predation papers, of the key resilience paper, and of this book chapter in the Panarchy book over time. And they're roughly the same scale, showing from 1960 to the present day and not including this year. But I think what's really, really impressive here is to show that the number of times each of these things is cited, even the one that's from 50 years ago, is still increasing. And I think that's uh, really telling because it's showing that these ideas that Buzz have had in ecology are major ideas that really any scientist, say like myself, would be happy to have just one of these ideas. And quite famous ecologists often are famous for one idea. And Buzz has had three of them in ecology. And I'm not even going to talk about some of his other contributions to ecological management and theory of eco ec ec ecological economics. Oh, sorry. Um, so. Th these ideas also are, are, are sort of connected and had sort of a, a time sequence to them. It, it's both from, I think, Buzz's life and as sort of Johan was talking about the major movements of science, of that this early work was coming out about as people were trying to understand things uh, after the Second World War and control and manage nature via sort of modernistic thinking and physics theory. Resilience was coming in sort of the first sort of rise of environmental awareness. And the days of adaptive cycle and panarchy are really coming at the brink of this sort of global or emergent global ecological era. So what were all these things? And uh, for people who are not so into math, uh, you don't need to worry about this too much. But basically, what Buzz really contributed to predation theory was actually the first theory to mathematically describe in a general way predation in ecology. So it's a really major thing that people use every day. And often in ecological textbooks, they talk about the Hauling disk equation, which I, when I was first reading, I was trying to figure out how there was a disk involved in this equation. And of course, there, there isn't a disk, but it's named after early experiments that Buzz used that used disks. So this is sort of showing how valued uh, these things are. And what, what he did is sort of simplified all the different ways that animals eat one another to say, well, you can really kind of think about oops, their type. There are three different types of predation. One is where sort of predators just sit around. And as the prey density varies, I'm sorry here, the, the uh, amount of predation depends just on how prey density is varying. So this could be like a spider with a web that as pr there's more prey, more, more prey comes into the web. 
The second type, which is maybe the most common, is where uh, predators have to do something. They have some maybe handling time or they can't, they have to digest the prey. So as prey increases, there's some maximum amount of eating of prey that a predator can do. And you get this line, then as prey density increases, there's some type of saturation. There's a peak amount of predation animals can do. And then the third type, which should be three there, is where there's some kind of learning or adjustment of the prey. So this is the idea when a prey is really rare, animals won't even think about eating it because it's not worthwhile for them to try and figure it out or so. So they have some search image of what's edible. But as it becomes more common, then they switch to it as they switch from doing one thing to another. And there you get this kind of S-shaped curve. And each of these different um, types of predation have different consequences for population dynamics. What's shown on this other side here is that you can kind of think of what's the death rate produced by these different types of predation. Uh, thanks, I should just change my settings. Uh, yeah. So the point being here is that these different types of prey interacting world can tell you about how prey uh, dynamics respond to these different types of predators. So in the first case, the death rate produced by predation is just a straight line. It's just independent. The second one, it declines and saturates. And the third one gives you kind of a more complicated shape where initially it goes up, then it goes down. And so this can generally tell you a lot about how the world works. And the, the way, way of thinking about this, oops. Uh, I'm missing a line here, is, is it, if you can kind of think about the combination of a birth rate and a death rate, or I should have the straight line up there of the death rate. If you put these two together and thinking about population dynamics, you can think where the birth rate is higher than the death rate, your population increases. Where the death rate is higher than the birth rate, the population will decrease. So if you think about your prey density, if you're below the critical point where the death rate and the birth rate are equal, you move up. If you're above that point, you move down. And this, this kind of thinking, which is in <coughs> economics and ecology, sort of comes from math or physics, is sort of this approach of comparative statics. And as Buzz was talking about, this kind of thinking is in our world, but often our world is a bit more complex of this. There isn't just a simple equilibrium. And his work on predation kind of laid the seeds of this kind of thinking. When he started to look at more complicated real-world problems with, say, looking at uh, budworm epidemics in Canada, where this, there's uh, an insect that periodically erupts into really high levels that uh, kill trees that people harvest. And so this was a really important kind of practical problem that Buzz started to get involved with because of his expertise in the theoretics of predator-prey systems. And when he looked at this, this is sort of a more complicated version of the figure I was just showing you, just sort of simplifying things. We're saying, as your population of budworm varies, you can think about, well, what's happening to the change of budworm? Is it the population increasing or decreasing? So the zero line is where it's constant. So those are these equilibrium points. And when Buzz looked at this, he found out that you could have two different equilibrium. You could either have a very low equilibrium of budworm or an epidemic outbreak. And what was kind of controlling your, your uh, transition between these is bird predation. And that when the forest was young, there was a lot of bird predation. It was, it, it was really difficult or next to impossible for the forest to move from this sort of low level of infestation to the high level of epidemic. If you're in an epidemic, you could stay in an epidemic. But birds would push you back to this lower equilibrium. But then looking at this, as the forests get, got older, the amount of bird predation or the effectiveness of the bird predation for controlling budworm decreased. And this is a, a complicated story, but it's basically in some ways that it's harder for the birds to find the, the budworm in a more uh, big forest. The, the, the forest dilutes the budworm for the birds, so they can't find them as easily. 